So, part three then of going over the 1997 Hire Paper for Practice. Only three questions covered this time, numbers 11 to 13, because I do go on a wee bit whilst going over each of them about wee extra points here and there and alternative methods for solving them. Right, so first it's number 11. So the idea would be you'd pause here, do it, and then check the video. So for number 11, the wave function question. Express the sum of the sines and cosines in terms of a single trig function, in this case a sine. Well, multiply this out. The sine of that compound angle. So it'll be sine x cos alpha, and then you've got your choice. Will I preserve the order of the functions or will I preserve the order of the angles? Preserve the order of the angles so they can switch over cos x sine alpha. <coughs> oh, something I should mention here. But it's commonly done in sort of accepted practice. Strictly speaking, if I just write x's for the angles, then that implies that they're in radians. You'll notice that in the exam papers. If there's no degree sign, it means they're in radians. Since this question is meant to be in degrees, I'm meant to put the little degree sign well, at the end there after each of the angles, but you tend not to, so I'm just going to be a bit lazy and not do that. I just hope it's obvious from the question. Right, next part. <clears throat> Since I want to make these two parts look the same, I'm going to oh, I forgot that bracket. <coughs> I'm going to extract the coefficient of sine x and highlight it with these courtesy brackets, just so we don't make any mistakes. Same with the coefficient of cos x. It's got k and sine alpha. Me multiplying it, just so I can see quite clearly that <coughs> comparing the two sides. The coefficient of sine x are the same, and the coefficients of cos x are the same. Because the technique for solving this is to equate coefficients. Strictly speaking, to equate the corresponding coefficients term by term. And if you do that, if you equate the coefficients, then starting with the sine x, I've got that k cos alpha must equal 2. Now, if you want, you could put that one down first if you've got a preference for putting the sign on top, if you're careless. Equating the cos x coefficients, I've got k sine alpha equals, just be careful here, but they're both negative, so they're both 5, equals 5. And what you've got is a pair of simultaneous equations. A pair of equations in k and alpha that have to be solved at the same time. So you have to think of some technique to eliminate one of them. Maybe by substitution, maybe by combinations. Well, it's combinations you use here. The first one is to get rid of the alphas. If you take the equations and add, square them and add them, you'll get this. <coughs> you'll have k squared cos squared alpha plus k squared sine squared alpha, that's adding that side, equals the 2 squared plus the 5 squared. And the handy thing there is, that's a common factor, so I'm left with cos squared alpha plus sine squared alpha equals 4 and 25. And cos squared and sine squared makes 1, which means I just have k squared equals that. Now generally you don't write that out, that's just implied by this identifying qualification here. So if I take 1 squared and 2 squared, I'll have this. k squared equals 2 squared plus 5 squared. Just missing out the part where cos squared and sine squared makes 1. So that's 4 and 25, that's 29, so k is root 29. Right, that's k dealt with. Now, to get alpha, I need to get rid of the k's. Dividing the equations, we'll get rid of the k's. If you take equation 2 and divide it by equation 1, the k's will cancel out. And of course, you can divide equations because the two sides will still be equal to each other. So I've got k sine alpha over k cos alpha is 5 upon 2. Of course, these, those k's cancel out, just leaving you with sine over cos, which is tan alpha equals 5 upon 2, from which alpha is going to be the inverse tan of 5 upon 2. <coughs> but where is it? Alpha can be anywhere from 0 to 360. Well, they're both positive. If you use the CAS diagram, the all sine tan cos diagram, cosine's positive, the sine is positive, so they're both positive there. Of course, the tangent just follows them, that's not a third condition. Then, using your calculator, just type that in, inverse tan, and it is just the first one I want, and that's what the calculator gives you. It gives you the answer closest to, to zero, to the origin. So that would give you 68.2 degrees. And then you just feed that in. So what have you got? 
2 sin x minus 5 cos x is root 29 sine of x minus 68.2 I'll put my bead degree sign back in now although you know some put it in those two maybe I'll put it in there as well there we go that'll keep everybody happy so that's the end of that particular one right so now it's number 12 the circles questions so pause and try it number 12 right it's not more of the axis Two identical circles, I might have said congruent, meaning identical, so they've got the same radius. They're touching at the point P, 93, I'm not bothered drawing in the axis. It tells you the equation of one circle and you define the equation of the other circle. Well, I can readily identify the centre of this circle, because that's just going to be 5, 2. Because you know that <coughs> when you squared the original expression x minus a and y minus b, that's going to be twice the product. <coughs> that's negative 2 times x coordinate, that's negative 2 times y coordinate. And equally, it should have been the x squared and the y squared equals the radius squared. So that's the x squared and the y squared minus the radius squared. So rearranging that, I'll just be these two. x squared and the y squared, so take away that 12 to get back to the radius squared. So that's going to be the square root of 25, 29, Take away 12, 17. So the centre is 5, 12, and the radius is 17. Maybe I'll give it a name. <coughs> C1, and I can identify it now. It's coming before the 9, so that must be the centre there. So that's C1. Right, so this question is, what's the equation of the circle? I'll call it centre C2. Well, it's identical, so I know straight away the radius of C2 is equal to the radius, the first radius. So the radius of the second circle is root 17. But what's its centre? Well, there's various ways of doing that. There's various ways I've seen, like, for instance, especially since there are equal steps between them, P is the midpoint. So I've seen the midpoint formula being used. I'll put down that, put that down briefly. If you were trying to find P using the midpoint, you would say, well, this is at 5, just call that X. This is at 2, just call that Y. And the answer to that should be 93. Just using the midpoint formula, only I, I know the midpoint, I just don't know one of the points. And then they form two corresponding parts. So 5 plus x up in 2 equals 9. 5, whoops, plus x is 18. So x is going to be take away the 5, 13. Similarly, 2 plus y up in 2 is 3. 2 plus y is 6. y is 6, take away 2, <coughs> so that's 4. So C2 is 13.4. Now that's one way, do that if you like. <coughs> but a very quick way is just to take steps. Going from C to P, C1 to P, how many along, how many up? Because however many along and how many up it is to get there, <coughs> it'll be the same again to go from P to C. And you can do that quite readily. 5, 2 to 9, 3. 5, 2 to 9, 3. 5 to 9 is 4, so you could just write it this way. 4 along, 2 to 3, 1 up. So add the 4. So you could put C2 this way. You could say C2 then is, if you start at 9 and go 4 along, and if you start at 3 and go 1 up, you get C2, same answer, 13, 4. And then you get the equation of the circle. You could do it that way. But I think here, just to practice vectors, I'll set it out formally. Oh, it's quite lengthy. Oops, it's easy. So I would say this. Well, how can you get to this point C2? Well, I'd start at P and make the move C1P. So if I work out C1P, C1P will be P take away C1. So it'll be 9, 3, take away 5, 2. I know it's very formal, but it's useful practice just for that. If I was just doing that, I'd probably just do the 4 along 1 up. But of course, that's exactly what this comes to. This just formalises it. 9, take away 5, 4, 1. That says it's 4 along 1 up formally. And then how do you get to point C, 2? Well, you get to C, 2 by starting at P and adding on the same move, adding on the move C, 1, P. So it'll be 9, 3, plus 4, 1. That's just a formalisation of that 9 plus 4, 3 plus 1. That takes you to 13, 4. 
which means C2 is 13.4, along with R2 being the same, which is root 17. Then you get the equation of the circle. Now it's quite lengthy. <coughs> you probably wouldn't do that in the exam, but that would be the formal way of doing the stepping stone business, the vector method, instead of using the midpoint formula in reverse. Then, equation of the circle. X minus A squared, Y minus B squared equals R squared. So that's x minus 13 squared plus y minus 4 squared equals root 17 squared, 17. And the last one here, number 13, the scalar product question. So pause and try it. Number 13 then. So what we've got, PQR is an equilateral triangle of side 2. Let me know that, side 2. And that just describes the directions of these vectors. Evaluate A dot B plus C and identify two vectors which are perpendicular. Well, the first stage we multiply that out. A dot B plus A dot C. Then, the scalar product. Well, you can work at the scalar product the component way, there's no components. The scalar product, the length way, would be the length of one vector times the length of the other vector, but only the product of the amounts that go in the same direction. Now, A and B head in slightly different directions. Well, we've got this. This is an equilateral triangle, so there's 60 degrees between them. So only a certain amount of A is going the same way as B. The amount of A that's going the same way as B is this part, the part adjacent to the angle. That'll be the cosine of 60. So and they're both lengths are 2, so that part's going to be 2 times 2 cos 60. Same with the next one, A dot C. Well, their lengths are both 2. So it's 2 times 2, the cosine of the angle between them, as they radiate from each other. Now C goes down this way from the end of A. If I want A dot C, I'll have to transpose C, take it to where A starts. So C would be the same as this vector down here. It's this angle I need between them. It's actually 120 degrees between them. So that's cos 120. It's an obtuse angle, the cosine will be negative, simply because if one vector is facing that way and you've got 120 degrees between them, they're acting in opposite directions. The component of this that lies the same way is the negative of the direction of that. That's going to give me a negative uh, scalar product. <coughs> but the cosine takes care of it. But what is the cosine of 120? Well, you could use that little cast diagram that I'm not awfully fond of, which, which seems to be becoming more ubiquitous. 120, starting at zero. 120 takes you to here, which means the effective angle, the acute angle for that, will be whatever's left over, that'll be 60. But it's negative there, so that'll be the same as 2 times 2 cos 60, I know I could have evaluated it, minus 2 times 2 cos, whoops, cos 60. <coughs> now, without even evaluating anything, you can see that's going to come to zero. I could have taken the time out to say, oh, that's 4 times, and then what's the cosine of 60? Well, that's a half, and if I wasn't sure, I could have reminded myself with that 60-30 triangle, 1, 2, root 3, cosine adjacent, 1 upon 2. But those the terms are identical, so that's it going. That's the first bit. It comes to 0. Now, what's the next bit? Well, that means that scalar product comes to 0. A dot B plus C equals 0. Well, that must mean that A is perpendicular to B plus C. That's the vector equal to B plus C, which you don't need to draw. But if you were drawing, it would be this one. It would be the vector B followed by the vector C. That's this one here. And you can see from the diagram that's going to add another 30, make 90 degrees. But again, you don't need to do that. It's just a simple fact. The scalar product is zero, so these two are perpendicular. Or you could formalise it. It says which two vectors are perpendicular? A and B plus C are perpendicular. Tick, you, la. There, yeah, so I've been done.